So welcome back everyone and thank you for staying right till the last um, talk and panel discussion. It really is going to be worth your while. Um, so I'm assuming we're mainly talking to the converted but there's always extra information that we can gain to optimise our vegan or healthy plant-based um, diet. So this is what this panel is going to be about. But before we kick off, just a reminder that this day has been hosted by Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. My name is Shireen Kassan, founder and director, and we are a community interest company led by healthcare professionals that provide education and advocacy on healthy plant-based diets. We provide individual health and increasingly for um, the planet and of course the animals we share this planet with too. Um, and we're blessed to have um, a diverse and highly qualified group of members um, who are part of our organisation and contribute actively to our work. And so it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce four of our very active, knowledgeable um, nutritionists, dietitians, doctors to host this panel discussion that will take care of any of your vegan dietary concerns um, and send you on your way with all the knowledge you need. So I will hand over and thank you very much. Hello everyone and thank you for coming or staying for today's last session by Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, where we will discuss some key dietary concerns for vegans. I'm Elena Holmes, I'm a registered nutritionist. I became vegan some 20 years ago, firstly for the animals, also because in those days there was there was hardly any talk about climate change or planetary health. But a decade or so later, when I started working towards my nutrition degree and assessing the evidence and so on, I became increasingly aware of countless health benefits of a plant-based diet. However, this long-term veganism also meant that I came across all sorts of concerns and scaremongering from different overnight nutritionists, we all know whom I mean, uh, also from all those obscure health coaches who also promote magical pills, coffee enemas, and obviously a carnivore diet, but also from health and medical professionals. I'm pretty sure that everyone here has come across every single one of these, and many more. Some of these concerns are what we in rigorously scientific terms call nutribolocks. <laughs> but some of them have a grain or two of truth in them. And that's why we have here today a panel with three super knowledgeable and experienced experts who will discuss and dispel some of those concerns alongside the ones that have already been covered earlier today and some of them will be also discussed tomorrow. Uh, pr the presentations will be approximately five minutes each, followed by a short discussion and there should be also some time left for a Q&A session at the end. So Soraya. <coughs> the scene is yours. Hi everyone, I'm Saray, I'm a dietitian. Um, I really appreciate you all staying towards the end of the day. We literally thought there was going to be no one here, so this is very exciting. Um, the topic I'm going to talk to you all today is about bone health and is bone health a concern for vegans? So the reason why I've chosen this topic is because it's been in the media recently that vegans are more at risk of fractures than omnivores. So there's been a few studies published and I'm going to go over those and give you the conclusion of them. So you've got the answers to go away today. Um, it's fair to say I haven't got time to go through the studies in detail, but if you look at my Instagram account, I have posted the studies up on there with the references and with the conclusions. And I'll answer your questions today as well. Um, another reason why this topic is really important to speak about is because when we're growing up, we're taught to, that we need to eat dairy to get our calcium, whereas we know we can get calcium from plants. We're told that we've got to eat dairy for strong bones, whereas we know that's not true. In fact, the countries have got the highest intake of dairy, got the highest rates of fractures as well. So where does that leave us? Um, the studies that were published, I'll give you the conclusion of the participants actually. So collectively, 
the vegans that took part in the studies were not meeting their protein requirements. They were not taking vitamin B12 and vitamin D supplements. They were not meeting their calcium requirements. They had dietary inadequacies, okay? So these are all key factors that we need for bone health. When the study participants were recruited, they were way back in like 1990. So food fortification wasn't so well known then and products weren't food fortified. Um, supplementation wasn't so widespread. And also how to get nutrients on a plant-based diet was not so well known as it is now. So we've got a lot more knowledge that we can spread out to communities now. So what do we need for bone health? Well, all the talk about calcium and dairy is miss everything else that we need. So for bone health, we need, we need protein. We need to be making sure we're not underweight and we're meeting our calorie requirements. We need our vitamin D supplement in the winter, as does everybody. It's not just vegans. We recommend vitamin D supplements for everyone in the winter months because we can't get it unless it's in the sunshine. There's also things like zinc. Um, phosphate, there's magnesium, there's, there's folate, there's other nutrients that we need that collectively for bone health that are really important. Another really important factor is exercise. So this one really gets missed. So a variety of activity is really important. So walking is going to maintain bone density. Cycling, swimming, that's going to maintain your muscle strength and any resistance work or weight training is going to help your bone strength. So all these are more important. Um, and let's remember some key facts here. So this is for everybody. One in three women will have a fracture once in their lifetime, and one in five men will experience a fracture once in their lifetime. And let's remember as well, when we age, we steadily lose bone mass and bone strength. So for everybody, it's really important, especially for females, when we hit that menopause age, we have a maximum loss of bone mass and strength. It's three to 4% around that menopause age, which is really key that we consider all these. So is bone health a concern for vegans? Well, bone health is a concern for everybody. The good news is you can do plenty about it. Eat a varied plant-based diet. As you've heard today, it's key that we have plant protein at each meal. Eat your green leafy vegetables eat the rainbow. If your plate is looking white and bland, you've got to put some colour on there. Um, if you are really concerned, go to the Plant-Based Health Professionals website. You're going to find some resources, some information written by doctors and dietitians. You can look at um, nutritionists and dietitians, and we're the ones who can assess your diet. Because I heard someone ask a question today, which was, how do we know if we're meeting our nutrients? Well, you, can't, you, you won't really, but that's what we, we're here for. We're the professionals. Come to us, we'll assess your diet, and we'll give you the guidance. So hopefully that's helped and answer some questions on bone health. Um, I feel like I have a lot more to say, but it'll probably come out in some Q&As. And what I'll do now is I'll pass on to my colleagues and friends, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. So I'll pass you to Sue. Okay, so um, my topic for today um, is... Um, to dispel the myth, I can't go vegan because of all the carbs. All right. So uh, by way of introduction, I'm Dr. Sue Keneally. I'm, I have two roles, really. Uh, one is as a GP, but I also work as a, a specialist obesity, obesity physician. Uh, so weight loss doctor, which is my favorite job. So um, I've got a few other things uh, going on, but I want to bore you with that. So let's look at this. Uh, essentially, I've got two messages for you today. Okay. Um, and to answer the question, true or false, it's false, okay? Um, there's nothing particularly wrong with a high carbohydrate diet, so that's not a reason to not go vegan. Um, and you can completely be a low carb vegan if you want to be. Um, so if you want to switch off for the next four and a half minutes, please do. Um, but if you want to look at the evidence, um, let's go through it. So looking at high carbohydrate diets are healthy. Um, I'm just going to turn around because it's bigger. Um, so at the top left, that's a paper by Sartorius and colleagues. Um, they did a systematic review, which is the highest quality evidence we have um, about whether a high carbohydrate intake leads to increased risk of obesity. And they concluded that there was no evidence. Um, they thought that maybe there was some evidence 
that you had an increased risk of obesity if your diet was more than 70% carbohydrate, but that's really high. Um, and I don't know anybody who knows a lot about nutrition who would recommend a carbohydrate diet of 70% intake because that leaves you only 30% for protein and fat and that that's simply not enough really. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that anyway. So anywhere between um, 40 to 65% carbohydrate was thought to be completely fine. Um, then, uh, Bottom left, um, that's a couple of colleagues, uh, Mike Lean and Tom. Um, they analyzed lots and lots of studies looking at different macronutrient compositions. So that's what percentage of your diet is protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And then they looked at um, different people following different patterns and their risk of weight gain and obesity. And they concluded that overall, there's no specific macronutrient composition that leads to healthy weight or um, overweight or obesity. Um, it's, a, it's about the individual person. Uh, looking over the right hand side, as you're looking at it, um, top one, dietary carbohydrate and the risk of type 2 diabetes. Again, um, they concluded there was no real evidence that a higher carbohydrate diet um, increases your risk of diabetes. Um, and then bottom right, um, lovely colleagues, um, Dr. Bernard and Al, if you ever have a question about nutrition and uh, the vegan diet, look at Neil Bernard. Or, or Michael Greger, because they've usually, between the two of them, answered it for you. Um, so Neil Bernard looked at plant-based eating for type 2 diabetes prevention and treatment. Um, he concluded that um, a high-carbohydrate diet um, is, is absolutely fine in, in terms of controlling your blood sugar. There's no reason why you shouldn't eat a, a high-carbohydrate diet within reason. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, closer. And... Um, lost my train of thought, and also uh, a higher carbohydrate diet, so based on um, vegetables, fruits, legumes, and whole grains, um, was also useful for treating complications of diabetes if you already have diabetes. So it, it's recommended both for um, preventing diabetes and for treating it. Um, however, carbohydrate quality is important. Um, if you're eating from the top of the screen, um, you're not going to be doing yourself any favors. Okay, those things do lead to diabetes and obesity. All right. If you're down the bottom with the fruits, veggies, whole grains, legumes, um, those are the things we talk about when we say a high carbohydrate diet is safe for you to avoid obesity and diabetes. This is the stuff we're talking about. Okay. Um, if you're at the top half of the screen, um, that, that's, um, I think that's probably a diabetes starter kit, actually. <laughs> I try and avoid those things. Um, what if you want to be low carb? Um, can I confess, since I'm amongst friends, that if I need to lose weight, I actually reduce my carb content myself? Um, but that's a personalized thing. It's, some people respond very well to high carb diets. Some people respond better to low carb diets. It's about finding the thing that works for you. Uh, most of the time I eat relatively high carb, but sometimes cutting the carbs for a, a week or two helps me. Um, so some ideas. Um, it doesn't have to be miserable. So um, top left, that would be a, a walnut and green salad with um, a creamy dressing made with probably cashew nuts, something like that. Top right, um, uh, my trademark chocolate tofu smoothie. A um, couple of people have tried that here today. I, I had one. <laughs> oh, yeah, you had some, didn't you? Yes, it's very nice. Um, Bottom went kia seed pudding, that's fairly low carb. And then I put the pasta in, you, you can buy pea and bean based pastas and then put um, low carbohydrate sources with them if you want to. And um, just to say, um, towards the end of my slot, um, I've put a screen with QR codes. Um, there's one for Facebook and one for Instagram. So whichever you want, if you, if you want to scan the QR code, um, it'll take you to a longer version of this talk with some of the recipes. Oh, there it is. Okay, we've got there. So feel free to scan those. Um, I, I posted them a week ago on my socials. Um, and as I said, it tells you a little bit more about the details of the trial. So you can go through the evidence, gives you the actual references so you can um, access them yourself. And I've made sure they're all freely available. You don't need to be paying for any sort of PubMed account or anything. You'll be able to access them and some, some recipes and, and tips and tricks that I've learned over the years. I'm going to hand over to Julie. Thank you, Sue. Uh, hi everyone, my name's Julie Stewart and I'm a nutritionist and thank you for being here today with us. So when I was asked to talk about this topic, I thought that our reasons and concerns when we decide to go plant-based are as individual as we are. So I was thinking back to what were my biggest concerns when I went vegan and they were what I called the three C's and that was cost, 
cooking and commitment. And research tells us time and time again that the, the biggest concerns and, and um, what really drives our, our food tastes are uh, three things, and that's cost, convenience and taste. And this really will uh, bear relevance on what choices you make for your foods. So I'm going to give you my top tips on these three things. So cost-wise, basing your foods around the nutritious nine, so that's fruits and vegetables, including sea vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, are what's not only going to keep costs down, but these foods happen to be the best for your health. And a recent study in the Lancet Planetary Health concluded that a whole food vegan diet is actually the most affordable way to eat and can cut food costs by up to a third. So cheaper and healthier, it's a win-win. But what are you going to make or cook from these staple ingredients? And this is where some people are challenged, especially when starting out on a whole food plant-based diet. So it can be an adjustment, uh, an adjustment to your taste buds, and it's a whole new way of constructing your meals. So the, the best way to start off is really keep things simple. So just a plate full of baked sweet potatoes, maybe some pile on some steamed broccoli, smother with hummus or tahini and lemon juice, and trust that you have a perfectly balanced, nutritious meal right there. I love creating Buddha bowls because the great thing about whole foods is you can just throw a load of random ingredients in a bowl together and it just seems to turn out well every time. So you don't need complex recipes or unusual ingredients. And have fun and experiment in the kitchen. You don't need to, um, to really sort of miss out on your favorite cuisines and flavors. You can try everything out. It's just about changing your habits. And that can be as simple as using water instead of oil for frying, or using herbs and spices instead of salt for seasoning, or um, switching your usual processed food or your animal-based mains for vegetables, tofu, tempeh, or legumes like lentils, chickpeas, and beans. So try out different types of whole grains as well. We tend to sort of stick to the usual boring rice or whatever we're used to, but try a different variety. Now, commitment-wise, some people are concerned that they're not going to be able to stick to this way of eating when they start a whole food plant-based diet. Um, but there really are no rules. Uh, a, a recent study, uh, according to a, a recent study, um, out of 2,000 participants, shockingly, over half of them confessed that they would likely pretend to still be plant-based, even if they'd failed at it. Well, failure is not a word that I like to use because you can't fail at this. Just take it one step at a time. Go at your own pace. There are no rules. So just um, know that the cycle of change varies per individual. We're all different. And the secret to learning to eat well and make sustainable changes actually lays in an understanding of how our brains work. We know that from behavioral psychology, uh, a, a new habit is formed by a cycle called the Q habit reward cycle. Um, so you start off with a, a clearly defined action plan that will take the load off of willpower. And then the Q is just the trigger. Uh, so for example, that might be the time of day or walking past your favorite coffee shop. And the trigger is just the behavior or the routine. So that might be every time you walk past your favorite coffee shop, you go in and have your morning latte and muffin. And the reward is that 
dopamine hit or that adrenaline rush that our brains get when we consume our coffee and muffin. And that's what makes our brains figure that this is a habit that's worth remembering. The trouble is our brains don't differentiate between a habit that's serving us well and one that's less beneficial. So that's where it's good to become an observer of your habits and know that you are in charge to change them if you want to. The more you eat a whole food plant-based diet, the more you'll reap the rewards from it. And these are both short-term and long-term rewards. So in the short term, we know that our gut microbiome can actually change its composition to a healthier one within just five days of switching the way you eat, more of those plant fibers going in. And in turn, that's going to affect your taste buds, your food choices, how your immune system works, and even your mental health and well-being. We know from um, from research that uh, our mid to long term rewards are lowered blood pressure, lower cholesterol, lower triglycerides, there's less inflammation in the body. And many like myself will reap other rewards such as weight balancing or increased energy, mental clarity, and even enhanced spirituality. So it's not about discipline, it's about habits. So where do you start with all of this? Um, and for inspiration, I'm going to just share a, a picture of me when I started out on my health journey. And I was um, suffering from chronic multiple diseases at, at the time. This was before I went vegan. And for anyone out there who's thinking, where do I start? I have such a long way to go, this feels overwhelming. Just take it step by step, because that's how I changed everything. Small steps that led to huge changes over time. And you can all do this. We're all individual. We're all on our own journey. And you've got this. Thank you. Thank you everyone for such brilliant, absolutely smashing, brilliant, informative and empowering presentations. Uh, as for myself, I can't resist making a little comment about thinking about carbohydrates. We all know about this super popular trend of high fat, low carb diet promoters. And it really amazes me, or annoys me, depending on a mood swing, uh, how anally, not to be confounded with analytically, pedantic they are in distinguishing between good and bad fats, whilst at the same time completely in ignoring even more obvious abysmal difference between, between health-promoting carbs and not so healthy carbs, like refined, ultra-refined, ultra-processed carbs. So I just <laughs> couldn't resist <laughs> noticing. So, so does any one of you have any comments or want to add something? Or are we ready for questions from the audience? Yeah, I got questions. Yeah. OK. <laughs> yeah, Judy was talking about cooking. And um, one of the things I find when I'm talking to non-vegans about cooking, they seem to assume that if, if you're going to become a vegan, you need to have like a hundred different recipes that you make regularly. Um, and that then, then will put some off. So I, I usually say to them, how many dishes do you actually make? And the chances are they will make a curry, <coughs> a few variations, they'll make a chili, they'll make a spaghetti or some sort of pasta dish. So that most people, I'm talking about meat eaters here, maybe only make five or six different dishes. So I say to them, actually, what you need to do is think about a vegan alternative. So there's lots of vegan chili recipes out there. So go, and, you know, if you regularly make a meat chili, go and find, try out all different vegan chilies. If you regularly make a curry, find a curry recipe, and then it becomes much 
more doable, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're bang on there. You know, we only really eat within a very limited palate. And I think when you go vegan or plant-based, you actually expand your repertoire of different dishes a lot more than, than most meat eaters would. But I'd say, you know, to keep it simple when you start out, uh, you know, just having a couple of ingredients on your plate actually really does um, readjust your taste buds in terms of not having those sort of hyper palatable foods that are sort of more on the processed side of things that actually sort of tend to be the less healthier foods. So um, keeping things simple does a couple of things. It really readjusts your taste buds, but it also makes your life a lot easier. So just have sort of um, a repertoire of say five to seven different recipes, family favorites that you enjoy. Like you say, veganize your, uh, your usual favorites and uh, and you're off and running and then you know maybe when you've got some time on a sunday afternoon and you're feeling creative you can have a a bash at some some different recipes in the kitchen but certainly you know there's no pressure or expectation to be making all sorts of complicated dishes hi everyone thank you for this week it's been really interesting i was wondering how you can pass you for the sake of so I'm coming to the expo today and there's been some lovely food, like some pasta, like some very good dishes. And it's often very tasty, but do you think that because vegans have become so popular now, there's only one healthy choice that's available for the public? Mm -hmm. And how do you combat that and ensure that you can be healthy and be the same time? Yeah. I seem to have the microphone, so I'll start. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. I've been vegan long enough that I remember when there was no, really no vegan fast food. Um, and um, I, I've gone on record previously, I, I think at VegMed or somewhere, and um, saying that I'm worried, you know, all the evidence that we're now producing, like Dr. Bernard and, and Michael Greger and so on, they're writing about, you know, the vegan diet is the best one, it's amazing. Um, it's only if it's a healthy vegan diet. And there are some trials out there that show actually, if you eat an unhealthy vegan diet, I hate to say it, but you'd be better off being normal, um, which is terrible. Um, so I think it's an uphill battle. Um, and I think it's just a reflection of our society that um, these fast foods are designed um, to be addictive. Um, the food producers and the supermarkets want your money. I don't blame them. You know, I have a job and I want money too. I get that. Um, but they spend millions, if not billions, researching how to make things really addictive and really tasty so that you'll keep buying them. And so that's what's in the stores. That's what's available because I know that's what sells. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I agree with everything Sue said. And the key thing really is to centre your diet, your food, your plate around the whole foods, the tofu, the lentils, the tempeh, all the fruits, all the veggies, all the grains. And then it really is moderation. Like we're not saying don't ever have any of the processed foods, like be realistic, but you know, have some occasionally. So that's what we say. But the more and more people, if your diet is solely highly processed, an ultra processed, it's full of sugars, it's full of salt, it's full of saturated fat. So health wise, it's not gonna do you any favors at all. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Um, just any more questions from the audience or any comments? Yep. Um, hi, uh, my question is gluten-free and is now on a low fiber diet. He doesn't like eating foods. So what would you recommend for like increasing his protein, which is something he's kind of worried about, but also not having too much soya, but if it's a lot of boundaries. <laughs> Uh, so it's the question like how do you manage um, increasing protein when you're following low FODMAP? Yeah, oh gosh. Well, first thing is this person needs to go and see a dietitian <laughs> straight away. Are they going through anybody? Are they following a dietitian or are they just doing this themselves? Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, I would recommend they do see a dietitian to follow because it's the FODMAP diet is really complicated. It's an elimination and reintroduction over a very long period, like a three month process. That's the first thing to do. Um, guys, panel, do you have any comments on, on that sort of question with low FODMAP and gastro yet? I'll pass to Julie. There you go. I think the, the FODMAP diet 
as a therapeutic diet is very useful when, when you're having reactions to foods, as your partner w probably is. Um, but I think it, it's not a long-term diet. It's not, it doesn't include the diversity of, of different plants that we want to stay on long-term. So while he's on that diet, that may well manage symptoms in the short term. But what he needs to be looking at ultimately is improving his gut health. So um, seek some advice on, um, on improving uh, the diversity in the gut, maybe get some tests done to see actually what's going on with the balance of um, the beneficial bacteria and less beneficial bacteria. Has he got any parasites, which are very common guys, like 80% of people have par parasites. Um, has he got any uh, yeast or fungal over overgrowth that's affecting digestion? Because ultimately we are designed to eat these foods. They're designed by nature and they are our natural diet that we should be eating. So um, that there's no reason why you can't work on your gut health and then start enjoying and reintroducing all of those different types of foods again. Beans are like, they should be a staple of, of a healthy diet, of a whole food plant-based diet. So yeah, he, he needs to be working towards getting those foods back in. Thank you. And the last thing to add about that, it's also about finding the threshold because not all FODMAT foods, foods are equally non-tolerated. So some foods like beans are more likely to create issues. Things like red split lentils, much less. So again, it's at that reintroduction stage. It's yeah, just sort of reintroducing slowly, gradually, one at a time and seeing where you can get there, where the, that person can get with it. And sometimes there could be quite good surprises that actually it's not as bad as you thought it would be. So. I just, I, I just then after thought then on our plant-based health professionals website there is a lots of dietary information. There's information on um, IBS, FODMAPs, and how to cook with beans and lentils and reduce blo uh, bloating and gut gut symptoms. But strongly recommend if anyone's got any gut issue, see a doctor and see a dietitian or nutritionist as well. Um, any more questions or comments from anybody? Question. Do you recommend to do uh, some blood tests or exams regularly to uh, make sure that the balance is right? I, for example, I found uh, that I was iron deficient only when I tried to give blood and they didn't, they didn't want it. Yeah, so the question was, do we recommend a regular blood test to check you're getting your nutrients? Is that about right? Yeah, so I would recommend yearly B12 test with your doctor to check your requirements are okay. Um, if you're symptomatic, so if you, I, I'm sat next to a doctor here, I should pass it to the doctor. <laughs> but yeah, I was going to, I'll, I'll answer then, I'll pass it to you, Sue. But, you know, if you're, usually if you're symptomatic, if you're having symptoms, if you're fatigued or any symptoms at all, then it is, yes, go into your doctor and if there's justification, then they will do your blood test for you. But definitely a yearly B12 test um, is, what I would is what we recommend anyway. Would you like to comment on anything else, Sue? Yeah, um, I'd agree with that. Um, just to give you an NHS perspective, if you go to your GP and say, can I have bloods just because, they'll probably say no because they have to be mindful of NHS resources so they won't do blood tests for the sake of it. Some will, and obviously, because I'm plant-based, if a, a vegan comes to me and says, can I have bloods? I go, of course, darling, of course you can. Uh, but uh, not every GP will do that. Um, if that happens to you, there are plenty of companies that will do it privately. Um, slight declaration of interest. I work for Thriver, writing medical reports, um, and I write endless medical reports for vegans who can't get blood tests from the GP. So I'd highly recommend Thriver. Uh, that's T-H-R-I-V-A. Um, they do charge a bit, um, but the reports, of course, are excellent. Um, but they, they do the full range. You can get um, your iron, um, your, your B12. You can get your omegas checked if you're worried about. Was, was anybody in the, the omegas talk earlier? Um, you can get those done. So I um, highly re recommend those. So don't get too despondent if your GP says no, because most of them will, and it's for good reason. Sorry. No, I'll say 
Um, yeah, I had, to, I had a similar experience, but I have got a very good GP. So I went to the doctor and so I was like super tired. Um, it was all, I'm a mum, I got a young boy, but I went and got my blood checked anyway. But luckily my doctor, I had justification with fatigue and tiredness. So my doctor did check them as well. But I have had friends in similar situations who are vegan, who wanted blood tested, and the NHS doctor said, you know, flat, no, there's no justification with it. So yeah, at least he's giving you some options there. Okay. Yeah, of course. So I'm a one doctor, three nutritionists, is that right? Can I ask a little bit about the experience in the field? Is there kind of change occurring in nutrition and in medicine and other plant based diets? Is it becoming more widely accepted? What are your perspectives on that? Mm, okay. Um, Yes, you've got dietitians and doctors here. So the question is, um, in our experience, is plant based eating and vegan diet becoming more well respected and well known? Is that right? Yeah. Um, so for me, so I'm an NHS dietitian and I work privately as well. My NHS job is I work in the weight management service. And my answer to that question would be yes, because now what we do in our weight management services, when we run our nutrition groups, we're giving people the option. So the key thing is we let people know the evidence, talk to them about the evidence, and then they can go away and make that informed decision. So we offer them the option of doing a vegan, uh, sorry, vegan diet, plant-based diet, Mediterranean, um, and they've got the choice then. So yes, it is becoming more and more um, receptive. And when I do my one-to-one -one consultations as well, every consultation, I'm sharing the evidence, um, letting people know, checking what their medical conditions are and how a plant-based diet would help that. And I give people the choice. And if I'm honest, sometimes the response I get is, to be honest, I want to eat my bacon sandwich and that's what I want to do. And that's the response. And that is a patient's choice. And then sometimes people are really intrigued. They don't know the evidence. They didn't realize that this is an option on how to do it. And I support them doing that. And I have supported people doing it one to one. And they've had fantastic transformations and amazing results. So yeah, hope that answers your question from my perspective. Would anyone else like to comment? No. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just a little example. I practice in north of Yorkshire. So, and I had a beef farmer's wife coming to me inquiring about plant-based diet. So I said, well, I explained everything, but I said, but will, be, will it be okay? How, what about your husband? Because yeah, he, he farms beef and he eats beef. So, so and he, she said, oh, doesn't matter. He'll eat what I cook. So that shows the change that wouldn't have happened 30, 20, 10 years ago. So. Yeah, it's changing. Any more questions? Yes. Could you give me some indication of weight loss over time? What would you expect somebody who is either stage one or stage two obese, uh, if they're following a plant based diet? How long do you think it will take them to get within a healthy range? That is a big question. <laughs> and very individual. Um, it's so individual. But what I, what I can tell you is what we recommend for weight loss for anybody. So we always recommend like a sustainable, realistic rate of weight loss, which is one to two pounds a week. And people get that weight loss by being in a calorie deficit of about 500 calories per day. So generally, if you are doing a plant-based diet or lifestyle, you don't have to count calories, but you do have to be in a calorie deficit. So we do have to be mindful of your consumption because that's the way you lose weight. There's different ways you go about it. So I couldn't really give you an estimated time frame, but I'm going to check with Sue and her experience. I'll pass to her. Yeah. You probably ought to know that Soraya and I work in the same NHS clinic. So we're talking about the same patient base. And... Um, we didn't know we were going to be talking on the same panel, did we? Yeah. No, we didn't. Um, so, yeah, it's extremely variable. Um, and I get a lot of frustration from patients saying, well, I'm on some sort of plant-based um, group, weight loss group, and someone else did two stone in a month. Why have I only done a pound? Um, and it's it's complex. It's about genetics. It's about physiology. It's about um, how you respond to the particular diet, maybe. Um, what I was saying about different macronutrient compositions, so low carb or low fat or whatever you're trying to do. Um, maybe you're not doing the right one for you and you need to switch things around a bit. Um, it's impossible to predict um, who's going to drop weight quickly and who isn't. 
Um, so what Soraya was saying about you know a sensible, moderate deficit, so you're not hungry all the time and not craving all your favorite junk foods is probably the right way to go, but with no expectations. I think the worst thing you can do is put pressure on yourself to set a specific goal by a specific time. We do, do talk about smart goals, you know, specific, measurable, um, achievable, um, relevant and time specific is the T. Um, and if you say, I'm going to lose a stone in a month, you're just setting yourself up for misery. So I would just go with it and remember a little bit of weight loss over a week or two, um, repeated over several multiples of weeks or two, adds up a lot. So it's baby steps, I think, is the way to go. So my question really was, uh, what your experience is in terms of the kilos over time? So if somebody over one year, would it have been your experience? What was your experience going from your early state to your present state? Class well, for me, I um, like Sue says, it's a real complex um, complexity, and um, it really differs per individual. Um, for me, I had a, a, an emotional eating disorder, and I, I, I guess I still have it today. It's just that I manage it with a whole food, plant based diet, and that meant that my weight went up and down. It fluctuated a lot uh, through my weight loss journey. I took, sometimes took two steps forward and one step back. Um, so I think that the, the main thing is to be kind to yourself and be gentle in the process. It's not a race to the finish line because that's not sustainable. You see all these diets in the media, you know, the beach body bikini diet and lose 10 pounds in a month or whatever. That is not sustainable. Yes, it will work if you decide to have a 1500 calorie a day diet but that is not enough to keep a, a, a small child going let alone a, an active adult so you really need to just trust the process and kind of let go and do it with love for yourself that's what it's all about um, and really don't make it like a um, an army boot camp or something because that's not going to be sustainable um, so really just you know if you do find that you put weight back on, it's going up and down a bit. It's what you do day in, day out that matters and it's creating those habits so that you are choosing, making healthy choices the majority of the time that's going to work out long term. And that could take months, it could take years, but just trust the process. Yeah. Um. Thank you. Just to say as well, there, in answer to your question as well, that there are some studies with some statistics with percentages and kilograms, and I cannot think of them off the top of my head. But what I can do is if you leave me your email, I'll send them over to you, and it might just give you a bit more of a clearer picture, if that's helpful. Yeah, OK. Yeah? I didn't quite hear that. Did you say what's the best food for parasites? Um, well, like I say, 80% of people have them. Uh, it's very common to have parasites. It's not ideal to have parasites, but when we travel abroad or, you know, when we eat food that we ingest parasites, or if you've got a, a, an imbalance of your microbiome, then parasites are very opportunistic and they will take that opportunity to grow. So in terms of eating foods to get rid of the parasites or keep them under control, well, having a balanced microbiome is key. So lots of probiotic foods going in, that's lots and lots of plant fibers, fermented foods, cultured plant-based yogurts, um, all of those sort of uh, foods that are going to promote a healthy microbiome. Uh, there are some sort of specific antimicrobial foods that parasites really don't like, things like garlic, cloves, um, herbs like coriander. Um, you'll, you'll sometimes see these um, in formulations for, for gut health for parasites um, because they are natural antimicrobials. And, and when you see a, a, a nutritionist or um, you know, a naturopathic functional medicine doctor, if they found that you had parasites that were causing you symptoms, because a lot of people have got them and they live quite happily with them, and you don't need to do anything about them. But if you've got symptoms and they're causing you an imbalance, they could be driving inflammation in the body or could be driving other symptoms, then what you'd be prescribed is um, a natural sort of antimicrobial. 
um, for things like grapefruit seed extract. Um, there, there's various different uh, herbal things like wormwood, um, and they tend to come in a formula together in a supplement. So that's how we would treat it very naturally. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, go ahead. What's your favourite high iron foods and what is your favourite recipe to put your high iron food in? Favourite high iron foods? Um, well, I, I, I like a, a high iron cocktail that I make, which is, um, it's, it's got molasses in. So molasses is a, a, a sort of um, um, a waste product of the sugar production, um, but it hasn't got, it's, it's not like a refined sugar. And molasses is really high in iron. I don't know if you've ever seen it or heard of it. It's like treacle and you can pop it in um, into a blender with some peanut butter and some plant milk and make yourself a nice high iron cocktail um, but also you know green leafy vegetables great for iron um, um, lots of other iron rich foods let's pass it along see who else can come up with some <laughs> i was going to say green leafy vegetables sorry <laughs> um. Um, it's in, yeah, yeah, literally put vitamin C on your meals because it helps with the absorption, but also what prevents the absorption. So like tea, coffee. So a lot of us in the morning, we'll sit and have our breakfast, and our cup of tea. We always, mostly, sorry, drink hot drinks for our meals. So avoid that. You want to leave it at least 30 minutes, if not 60 minutes, um, separate from your meal times because that prevents the absorption as well. Everything you just said, lentils, tofu, um, you know, legumes and the green leafies apricots, um, raisins, absolutely loads. <laughs> yeah. May I add also Guinness beer, believe it or not. It's because of blackstrap molasses mentioned by Julie. So I don't like Guinness. I'm okay with beer, but I don't like Guinness. My favorite is red kidney beans. In all forms, stews, casseroles, curries, red kidney bean burger. So you get the idea. So. How useful is the iron fish for iron? At height. Mm, that's interesting. And actually, I, from what I read and from what I heard, it works. Also, it could be iron fish. I don't know if everyone knows what it is. So it's practically a, a fish made of iron, which you put in your stews, especially if you cook something like with tomatoes, which besides vitamin C have different other organic acids. So, and those acids help to pull out that iron from that iron fish, thus enriching your food, whatever you are cooking with iron. Another thing would be to, good, to use good old fashioned uh, cast iron pots. So without any coating, again, some of the iron from those cast iron pots, they are su it's supposed to leak into the food. I don't think that's sort of a very huge amount of iron, but every little helps. So again, if you cook your red kidney bean casserole with tomatoes, so iron, vitamin C from tomatoes, and you use a cast iron pot, I think, yeah, it could be, the results could be quite good. Mm -hmm. yeah. I understood that the iron from cast iron pots or this iron fish is in a form that's not easily absorbed. Have I misunderstood that? I, I, I have to say, I haven't heard about it, but I mean, if there's plenty of vitamin C in the food, and if there is some so other iron. It's the, form, it's the form that the iron takes. Mm, so it's neither heme nor non-heme. It's some, some, some other. I have to confess, I don't know. That's not, not what I've heard, but I'll have to look at it. Does anyone know? No, okay. no it's yeah, strange. Yeah, yeah, it's some, something, yeah, food for thought. So thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, it got dark whilst we were talking, so it's really late. So thanks again, everyone, for coming, for staying so late. And thank you for your brilliant questions. So and all the very best. <laughs>